Hello and welcome to episode 435 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. I'm Nathan Fox. With me is Ben Olson. We're the co-founders of LSATdemon.com and the LSAT Demon Daily podcast. If you'd like to be LSAT famous, you can share news or ask questions with us on our website, thinkinglsat.com. Uh, we have a free class coming up with me. It's Double Black Diamond. It's our expert level logical reasoning class. If you'd like to see what logical reasoning classes look like with us at the highest level, uh, that's Wednesday, January 24th at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Again, it's a free class. You just go to lsat.link forward slash free and you can sign up for that class and a free demon account as well, which gets you all sorts of goodies. So if you've been listening to the show at all and you like our advice, please, please take advantage of that at lsatdemon.com. OK, producer Eric wanted us to kick it off today with this question. Ben, if you could propose one New Year's resolution for LSAT students, what would it be? The first thing that pops into my mind, which we've said so many times, so maybe this isn't new, but I still think it's a valuable resolution. And that is to focus on one question at a time. One question at a time and want to develop that a little bit further. Sh sure. Yeah. When you're studying for the LSAT, people can get all caught up in, hey, what score did I just get on that test? Uh, let me take another test to see if I can get a higher score. How many questions did I finish in that section? Oh, I didn't finish the section, yada, yada, yada. It creates anxiety and stress and it's counterproductive for that reason, but also just um, not a great way to learn the test. If you want to get good at the LSAT, you do a question and then you review it. Now, you may do a question in a timed section, but you do one question, then you do the next question question and then you do the next question until you're done with that section and then you have the chance to review those questions but the point is is that this entire process comes down to doing one question at a time your job at any given moment is to do that question as best you can and then go to the next question and if you can cultivate that mindset a lot of anxiety surrounding studying, surrounding law school applications, everything can go away. Say more about that. Well, um, a lot of anxiety comes from trying to do more than you really are meant to do at any given time, right? It's like trying to accomplish, trying to get in because your parents are telling you you have to apply now, trying to get in because your friends are getting in now, trying to do too much. Like you can't control how fast um, you're going to learn something, right? I mean, you can by doing, by studying in a more effective way, but on some level, you can't control how quickly you are going to grasp things. So you have to let go of timelines and just start focusing on one question. If you can learn and understand that question, then that's the fastest way for you to get to your best LSAT score. But we just don't know how long that process is going to be. I think what happens is people set these timelines and that creates stress and it you don't really know. Yeah. We can't even tell you. People come to us all the time. They're like, is three months enough? And it's like, yeah, it could be more than enough for you, or it could be totally inadequate for someone else. Right. Or the other way around. We don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't, we yeah. have no idea that there's, you know, now there, I guess we get, we get some predictors like, you know, if you take a cold diagnostic test and you score 165, then it's like, well, okay, <laughs> from a cold 165 to get into the 170s, I'd put money on that being less than a three month endeavor. Yeah. Totally. But that's rare, right? I mean, you just don't, people don't just roll out of bed and score 165 very often. Mm -hmm. um, it's more like, you know, the, I'd say the, the majority of, of new students that we see, they scored anywhere between 135 and 155. Those are kind of, yep. the, that's the, like sort of the, you know, and there, there's a big range even within that range. But um, yeah, at, at a 155, I look at that and I go, wow, that's really good. And I hope that you can get into the 170s. Like, I really do think you can get into the 170s. How long that's going to take? 
I I don't know. Like sometimes two months, sometimes twelve months. Yeah. It just kind of depends. Yeah. And I agree with your proposed resolution, which is to focus on one question at a time, because I think that that's the fastest way to improve no matter what level you're at. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, I guess mine, I would say something similar and, and just I would try to encourage people to do a little bit every day. You're you're going to have to like reprioritize your life if you're going to be a successful lawyer. You need to rearrange things so that your career is the primary focus of your life. And one tiny baby set step toward that is to find the time, carve out the time to do one LSAT question every day and, and get it right. The demon's built for that. Because you can just hit drill and do one question. It, it's a little different from Ben's tip because Ben's tip is like, I want you to do one question at a time and focus on mm -hmm. what's in front of you. I want you to put that one question in front of yourself every day. Uh, like, you know, sometimes people, oh, well, I haven't been able to study for a while. I've been really busy. Mm -hmm. You know, finals, holidays. Oh, new year. Oh, new semester starting in school. <laughs> you know, it's like there's always a, a, ne a next thing and a next thing and a next thing after that. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah. And that's how life is. Like, life's always going to get busier. But but you have to make that choice, don't you? That you're going to just make it a priority. It's the beginning of your legal career. And you, you want to get your legal if, if you want to get your legal career moving in the right direction. Well, if you're not yet in law school, the way to do that is by doing some LSAT practice. <laughs> and you just yeah. there's really no excuse. You know, it's not like, well, I'm going to wait for Nathan's class on uh, on on Wednesday or Thursday. You know, like I'll, I'll yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see him in class and I'll, I'll go to Ben's class on Monday. And it's like. Wait, <laughs> there's. There's lots of other days and there's 24 hours in the schedule and you can't just sit back passively and think that showing up at LSAT class is going to be enough. You've got to be working on it on your own. Just chip away at it a little bit at a time. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that suggestion a hundred percent. The only thing that makes me pause. So I agree with the suggestion to do a little LSAT every day. That may be an hour. That may be two hours for some people. Some days you may only have 15 minutes, but it might be one question while you're waiting in line at the grocery store on your phone. Mm -hmm. You know, I, but it's just like if you can't. I would think that even on your busiest days. I, mean, I don't want to be like an extremist and say, oh, it's your wedding day and you have to do, you know, it's not <laughs> not like that necessarily. But. Out of 365 days in the calendar year. I would think that you want to be working at it something like 300 of those days mm -hmm. It, mm -hmm. because the investment is just like all I want you to do is like get started. Right. It's that gym door mm -hmm. theory. Like you don't even have to work out. You just have to get your gym shit on. You have to get yourself to the gym. You have to touch the front door. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then if you then do that, it's going to happen. Mm hmm. If that's all you got in you, okay, fine. I mean, I don't really believe you. I think you're going to go in and you're going to do at least something once you get there. Yeah. But it's like to minimize the the perceived investment that you're putting in where it's like, well, I don't have to sit here for four hours. I don't have to do a full practice test. Mm -hmm. I have to do one question. And then once you do that one, hey, guess what? You might decide you want to do another one. But anyway, you sound like you have some uh, concern with this. Tip. No, I, so I, I love everything about the suggestion and the actual action item that you're giving them. The one thing you said was make work the primary focus oh, of your yeah. life. Yeah. And I hope to God that people don't have to do that to be successful as an attorney. I suspect a lot of attorneys, a lot of successful attorneys do make work the primary focus of their life. But I also wonder if that's necessarily the best path. Like sometimes people, right, they crush it because they also give themselves time to focus on other things outside of work. So when they come into work, they can give it their all. 
I don't know if that means it's the primary focus. I just hope that that doesn't have to be the case. I think that there is room for negotiation on that. I think that there are, I think that there are paths that can be taken, right? Like you can have a child and go to law school at the same time. You can have a child and practice law. And, you know, of course, if you have a child, the care and maintenance of that child is obviously your <laughs> primary focus, right? Like if you yeah, had to choose yeah. one, you're going to pick the kid. Yeah. But I guess, um, hmm, yeah, maybe, maybe my work, maybe I should have chosen different words. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's not like it, maybe it doesn't have to be the primary focus of your life. Although the successful attorneys that I know, it, it sure seems like work comes first in their life. Yeah, well, I do think what you're getting at, though, is that so many people have excuses, right? Yeah. And it's not like they're letting a child or a family member or friends get in the way of the LSAT. It's like stupid shit. And that shouldn't be happening, right? Even if that shit is like working late for a stupid job. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for, for sure. Yeah. No, I mean, I because I'm I am the guy who's also saying quit your job like, <laughs> yeah. well, you know, like, if because people come to us, they they want to transform their lives. You know, they mm -hmm. they boy, law school is such a fantasy for people like I. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. go to law school and I'm going to have this fabulous career and I'm going to be, you know, be so happy as a lawyer and I'm going to support my family and all this stuff. And it's like, well, yeah, OK, so you want to make big changes in your life. And, mm -hmm. and let's, you know, what was your, what's your practice test scores looking like these days? You know, where's your, where yeah. are your practice LSATs? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm like 148, you know, it's like, okay, well, good, great. You know, that's a, you can build from there, but you got a lot of building to do. Yeah. And when's that going to happen? And it doesn't have to happen all at once. You don't have to climb the whole mountain right now, but if you don't start taking steps up the mountain, it ain't happening. The mountain's not going to climb itself. Right? So yeah. you've got to like, I guess I just want people to be a bit more. Yeah. Serious and adult and decide that. Just like I carve out. 45 minutes to do a workout. Or just like I carve out. Time to call my grandmother. I got to carve out this time to work on myself. To, to work on my LSAT. And I do think that you've got to do it pretty much every day. Yeah. No, I totally agree. And I think it's totally possible. And <clears throat> you can make, you know, time for your family and friends. And I think they can provide a lot of support. And then you make time for the LSAT. And whatever other high priorities you have for yourself, maybe that's working out, like you said. And just let this other shit, like, go. Like, you can watch one fewer episode of some show on Netflix and whatever else like pulls you aside or, you know, social media, people get sucked into that scrolling for 30 minutes. It's like, yeah, you could have done the LSAT. Yeah. And made a lot of progress. Scrolling and TV are probably number one and number two. I'm not sure which one is the worst offender. Probably both because a lot of people do both at the same time. That's what's wild, right? It's like we're watching a show and my kids are like scrolling. I'm Everybody's like, what? on their phone. <laughs> what the hell is going on here? I know. Yeah, I know. Um, so there is that going on. And I, I yeah. would I would encourage people to, yeah, like stop turning on your television. Yeah. <laughs> and and you, know, you can have time for that even. Right. You just have to yeah. do the LSAT first and then right. you're going to feel good about relaxing. Right. Right. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks, Eric, for that uh, suggested conversation topic. I think that was useful. Happy New Year's, everybody. This show is going to come out on New Year's Day. You want to read this one from Anonymous? The subject is non-traditional applicant. Still hope for a top school? Question mark. Sure. Hey, Ben and Nathan. I'm in my late 20s and I have always wanted to be an attorney. However, I'm concerned it may not be in my cards anymore, given my age and my background slash stats. <laughs> what? Okay. Man, the perspective of 20 year olds is so strange, isn't it? Or 20 somethings. I mean, he's, yeah. this is late 20s. So, you know, yeah. let's say 28. <laughs> and 
but it's like, oh, yeah, I'm getting up there. I don't think I could do it. I don't too late for me. Just no. it's just insane. I mean, it, yeah. The only a person who's in their late 20s could have this perspective, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. anybody older than that is going to look back and go, what you think that's too old for anything. It's not too old for anything. Anonymous. Uh, well, yeah. If gymnastics. you end up going, to, yeah, yeah. There's sports, right? You're out. The Olympics are not going to happen anymore. <laughs> but, yeah. Not law school. It, anonymous. When you go to law school, cause I I'm having a feeling that you might end up being one of those people who ends up going. Um, you're going to see people in your class that are definitely older than you. They're going to be in their, late thirties, maybe some even in their forties. So don't maybe don't some even in their fifties. I mean, we've, t we've had correspondence yeah. to this show who were in their eighties trying to go to law school. So it's yeah. not, it's not absurd. Um, and especially in your twenties, dear God, no, I, yeah. I think you're like, if any, you know, you're maybe like a couple years older than what yeah. Harvard would want, right? Harvard you know, they've kind of gone out of their way lately to say we we prefer people with work experience. They've got that deferral program now for Harvard undergrads, junior deferral program where you can apply early to Harvard and then get get admitted, but not for right after law school, get admitted mm -hmm. for like or after undergrad, like get admitted for a couple of years later. Yeah. So they're signaling that they actually prefer people who have gone out in the world a little bit and done a thing or two and. So late 20s is not even you're not even going to be noticeably older than the average, I don't think. Nope. Anonymous continues a little background on me. Late 20s, URM, so underrepresented minority, undergrad from a top 20 school with a 3.3 UG GPA. I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. Undergraduate. OK, so usually we call that. UGPA. Don't, don't really care because yep. the next thing is what matters. Yep. 3.4 LSAC GPA. And That's all we M need. We don't need anybody to report anything else, right? I mean, your LSAC GPA is the GPA that schools are going to consider. So whatever your transcript GPA is, it's just irrelevant. If you have an LSAC GPA 3.4, that's the number we're working with. Okay. Anonymous also has an MS from one of the Ivies. I also have five years of work experience in investment banking and private equity. Shit, that's great experience. It's yeah. very legal adjacent. Yeah. I opted out of attending law school initially because of the exorbitant cost. Good. But I have now saved up enough for three years of living expenses without work. I would still need loans or scholarships for tuition. I've started studying for the LSAT with LSAT Demon. Amazing work, by the way. However, given my age and how low undergraduate G my low undergraduate GPA, would attending Yale, Harvard, Stanford, or Columbia even be possible? Yes. I'm going to lsatdemon.com forward slash scholarships. I, I just want to throw in here um, down at the very bottom of the page. We've got room for GPA. I'll put in 3.4. Do we have any LSAT numbers? We don't have any. Yeah. Okay. So let's put a number like 174 because that's the 99th percentile. I mean, you're talking about elite schools. Yes, you are going to need an elite LSAT to get yourself in the conversation at these schools. Checking the box for URM, which is just an estimate, you know, it's it's looking back at historical data and trying to figure out what kinds of deals people get. We think you're you, you get a bit of a bump for URM status. And even even after the Supreme Court ruling, it's hard to know exactly how that's going to affect things, but yeah, you're still getting some benefit. <laughs> I mean, it seems clear to me that they're not going to be able to have explicit race based policies, but I don't see how they are going to not be able to. It's a holistic process, right? Mm -hmm. They keep mm -hmm. insisting how holistic the process is. Well, if it's a holistic process, then we don't even know what you're doing behind the scenes. So why can't they give it URM bump? Yeah. I mean, you'd have to like. I'm just thinking what I would do if I was a law school. Mm -hmm. I would just I would go, OK, well, we don't want to fall. We don't want to run afoul of this new edict. Mm -hmm. So let's make sure that we're not doing things that are explicitly race based. <laughs> but I'm still going to like. Be interested in that, I'm still going to look at my own class composition and care. I don't know, I, I yeah, I mean, we're only speculating it. We'll have to wait until we, until we see what the new classes really do look like, but. Well, and the court itself, even 
gave an example, right, of how people might talk about their experience as a certain minority and how that might affect their chances of admission. So in the dissent, right? Yeah. And also, no, in the majority opinion. Oh, really? In the in the majority yeah, opinion? Yeah, yeah. John said, Roberts. Here's what you you are allowed to do. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Like you okay. could talk about your experience as this individual or this type of individual I in see. our society. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that to me just seems like there's an obvious loophole and workaround. It's don't don't be explicitly race based, but <laughs> you can ways. consider yeah. yeah the effect that race has had on some individual. Yeah, right. On all of the individuals who apply who have the status. I, I yeah. mean, I don't know. Yeah. It, anyway, um, I'm looking at a more than half scholarship at Duke, which is number five in the country. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Yale, Stanford, Harvard, those are all going to be just need based. But, you know, the, it, when I look, when I think back about the, the offers that I've seen where I was really surprised by the, by the admission to Harvard, I do, there's, there's a couple of them that stand out in my head where it's like, oh yeah, I remember when that guy got into Harvard hmm. with his like 160. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it, the, the, the examples that I remember are URM examples. Like if they're going to go, if, if they're going to take somebody with lesser numbers, it tends to be a underrepresented class of students. Mm-hmm. So um, wouldn't surprise me at all with the right LSAT. Great work experience. Uh, an MS. I wonder what that field is. MS. Probably finance would be my guess because yeah. investment banking, private equity. It's probably an MS yeah. in finance or accounting. Yeah. Those are, you know, it's like those are good degrees. That's that's like business adjacent. Mm-hmm. Great work experience. Yeah. Your GPA is is dragging down those schools in the top 14. But with the right LSAT, I don't know, it seems feasible to me. Yep. I agree. And age has nothing to do with it. I mean, you're totally off. Like, if anything, your age, age is not gonna holding you back you. in the slightest. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, that's a very attractive age to, for a law school applicant. They like having people there that are a little more serious. They like having people there that have actually had a job before. You just you should see how. Money. Yeah. <laughs> you should see how hysterical all the K through JDs are come finals time. And, you know, the people who have had jobs before in their lives just tend not to be in such a panic. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think you should apply broadly with the best LSAT you can possibly get. And, um, I, I think you've got great chances. I, who knows? Yeah. Let us know what happens. It's really going to come down to the LSAT. This next one is from Timothy. The subject is, is it worth registering for both April and June tests next year? I would say no, because the application deadline is not here yet. The the sorry, the deadline for the test, the registration deadline for the test is not mm-hmm. here yet. Mm-hmm. And I just don't see value in registering for tests way down the road. Am I wrong on that? I, I feel like you can always just wait until the deadline to register. And at the deadline to register, you can decide whether you want to register or not. But here's Timothy's email. Sure. Greetings, Ben and Nathan. My name's Tim, and it's my first week using the demon. I started off this year with a diagnostic test of 147, and after two or three months of studying with other test companies, I scored a 159 on my official October test. Sounds like you really probably weren't ready to take the test yet. I mean, 10 points improvement. We used to think that was good, right? Yeah, but, 12. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 12 points, we would have been like, yeah, that's pretty good. It's about what people would get, and... Since we started the demon, it's more like we're looking for 20 points um, or more. Mm -hmm. While I was happy with my progress, says Tim, I couldn't help but feel that I could have achieved a higher score if I received better instruction. I was consistently scoring minus 10 to minus 12 on reading comp because I was taking too much time making charts and writing notes about each passage I read. Making charts. Wow. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Yeah, we don't teach any of that type of stuff at the demon. 
It's my dream to gain admission to a top 14 law school, but my 3.6 UGPA, which is way below the median for most, if not all, of the top schools. I, I need a really high LSAT score to make my dream a reality, and with Logic Games as my best section, I've already registered for the June test, but would love to hear your opinion on how I should spend my next few months and whether I should also register for the April test. Thanks, Tim. Hmm. Wow. Well, if LG is your best section, yeah, these are your only two shots. Should you take the April test? I think it's a real simple calculus. I mean, figure out when the deadline is. And Ben, you've probably got that. When's the deadline for the uh, April test? Yeah, February 29th. Last day in February. February 29th. So you've got two full months here, Tim, to decide whether you want to take the April test. I would be going every day. Uh, I, I would be going hard on the LSAT every day between now and that deadline day of February 29th, you said? Mm -hmm. Leap day? Really? Yeah, apparently. Okay, so the deadline for April's on leap day 2024, and I would study hard between now and then. And if my practice test scores indicated that I was ready by February 29th, then I would register for the April test. If my practice tests don't indicate that I'm ready, then I don't register for the test. Yeah. Does it have to be more complicated than that? No, it doesn't have to be more complicated than that. And, and the point I think you're making here to Timothy is, look, games may be your best section, but you don't need a great games score to get into law school. You need a great LSAT score. So if you can't get there, if you can't get to the right LSAT score with games in time for April or June, mm. you're just going to have to buckle down and make LR and RC your strongest section. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, because let's also be honest, Tim, um, you know, with with a 3.6, you are below the median at top 14 law schools. Yeah. So to make up for your below median UGPA, you need an above median LSAT. And to get an above median LSAT at top 14 schools, you're looking at something in the 170s. Something in the 170s just doesn't happen when you're scoring minus 10 to minus 12 on reading comp. I don't care how good you are at the games. You're still not scoring in the 170s. Yeah. Right. You can be perfect on the games, miss 12 on reading comp, and you're you know, like, you're going to max out at 165. Not good. Not good enough. <laughs> not, not for what Tim yeah. wants to do. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. You, you do have to improve on all sections of the test, and games are only one third of the test. Soon to be none of the test starting in August of 2024. I'd work hard at it, Tim. I'm glad you're with the demon. Come to class. If you're a live subscriber, come talk to us. Ask us these questions in, in person. If you're a basic or a premium subscriber, that's fantastic. Use our videos, our written explanations. Use the ask button to get extra help. Register for the April test if your practice tests indicate that you're ready on the deadline day, February 29th. And if you're not ready, then you're not ready. So you just have to not take it. <laughs> I mean, but I would also say don't take it in June if you're not ready. I mean, just blanket advice, right? Don't take the official test unless your practice tests indicate that you're ready to take the official test. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Pearls versus turds time. This is where we take a uh, tip from the Internet and we uh, tell you whether we think it's a pearl of wisdom or a turd of not wisdom. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. This one's coming to us from Sneha. And the subject is Pearl or Turd, reading comp strategy for test takers trying to maximize for games. Huh. Okay. Hi, Ben and Nathan. Because of my accuracy on reading comp can be very inconsistent, could be 60 to 90%. I was recommended to view reading comp as three passages instead of four. Hmm. Usually when I try to ensure time for the fourth passage, I rush through the section, thereby sacrificing accuracy just to see more questions. Hmm. And by the time I get to the fourth passage, I may, have I may only have 
three or four minutes to read the passage, three or four minutes which could have been better used going through passages one through three and guessing on the fourth. Mm -hmm. In a perfect world, I would not be trying to rush my LSAT journey to be done by June. However, in my mind, I am better off in reading comp getting 21 out of 27 accurate with plus one or plus two from guessing on the fourth passage than like 19 out of 27 getting through all four passages. Is this good advice? Am I trying to rationalize a bad approach? Thanks. This seems like the question is entirely about reading comprehension. I have no idea why it said games in the subject. I guess I'm just going to let go of that. I think she's trying to rush her LSAT journey by being done by June. Oh, she's so trying. that she can take the test while it still has games. Yeah. I see. I want to go back to Ben's advice to the previous correspondent, you know, that you... <laughs> I don't care how good you are at the games. You, you, you also have to be as good as you can be at these other two sections. Like the games can't carry your entire score. You, you've got to be good at logical reasoning and you've got to be good at reading comprehension. The question here really is, can I be good at reading comprehension with only doing three passages? And my answer is yes. And if you do it that way, you might eventually realize that reading comp is easier than you're making it out to be. And you might eventually go back to doing the fourth passage after you've done the three passages with accuracy. She says my accuracy on reading comp can be very inconsistent, could be anywhere from 60 to 90 percent accuracy. So that's like really, really pretty bad, isn't it? I mean, that's not good on, yeah. on questions attempted. So you're never a hundred percent on questions attempted. Yeah. Best case Yikes. scenario, you're 90%. You really like want best to be case. You're never, you're never getting them all right. Yeah. You, you really should be focusing on two passages right now and getting between 90 and hundred percent. Right. Yeah. Well, what you should be doing is focusing on the first passage and getting a hundred percent accuracy. Yeah. Then you can look at the second passage and work on 100% accuracy. Then if you have time, you can do a third passage with 100% accuracy. You just have to get paid for the work you're doing. Um, yeah, and we're playing the long game here, right? I think when people hear that, they're like, one passage? What the hell are you right. talking about? How can I score anywhere in the 160s, let alone 170s, yeah, if you I'm can't. only doing one passage? Yeah, you, you can't. can't. But, this but is you your can journey. get good at reading comp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like you can learn how to do it the right way. You know, yeah. it's like, well, how am I supposed to learn how to become a U.S. Open golfer if all mm -hmm. I'm going to do is work on my chipping and putting? Yeah. And the answer is you can't. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. yeah. You need to work on more than just your chipping and putting if you want to be playing on the PGA Tour. Mm -hmm. But you do have to be damn good at chipping and putting. And what I'm telling you is if you practice your chipping and putting, it's going to pay dividends on all the other rest of your game. Well, back to Sneha, work on your chipping and putting in that first passage. Mm -hmm. Get good at it. Get, get good at real at recognizing right answers. Get good at realizing the wrong, like seeing how the wrong answers are wrong. Mm -hmm. Because if you're at 60 to 90 percent, geez, the midpoint there is a uh, 75 percent. Mm -hmm. So the midpoint of your accuracy range is you're going to miss one out of every four questions. But that means that one out of every four questions. You're missing a another one out of the three that you got right. I'm sure you half guessed on it. Yeah, so your 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 skill level is 50 percent. Yeah, right. You're you're like. Uh, the ones that you're actually getting right, where you like, you know, you got it right. That's like you're doing about 50 percent accuracy. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the on the rest of them, you're just like, well, yeah, you know, I, I got rid of those answers. It can't be that one. It can't be that one. It's got to be one of these two. Hmm. I don't know. You know, this one just seems like it's a little better than that one. <laughs> OK, well, no, there's a reason why the wrong answer is wrong. And there's a reason why the right answer is right. And yep. so you've got to find those reasons. You've got to refuse to pick wrong answers because they are wrong. There's something in there that makes it wrong and you just can't pick it. And you've got to learn how to see that. You've also got to learn how to not not pick the right answer. Right. It's sitting there right on the page and you're like, nope, not that one. And it's like, oh, ooh, really? Uh, hmm. OK, 
you're you're making a mistake there. You know, you're making two mistakes. You're picking a wrong answer and not picking the right answer. Mm -hmm. Uh, we got to got to clean that up a little bit. Isn't that interesting, though? Like the student sees their mistakes. And then they give themselves like full credit for all the ones that they get right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what they're not understanding is that they're they're not even really understanding the ones that they're getting right. At least yeah. a, a big chunk of them. I'm sure that you couldn't explain it to me. You have no reason. You have no idea why that answer is right. Yeah. Yeah. Like you didn't really eliminate those four wrong answers. You just kind of got close and said, well, yeah, I mean, it feels like probably that one. It's wild, Which, though. You it, might be right. <laughs> but yeah. That doesn't mean you really you really understood it. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's weird, though, because we've all been in that situation, right? We're teaching a class and someone is getting frustrated because they can't explain why D is correct. And then they throw up their hands and they say, well, I got it right. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> what? Like, who cares? Like, <laughs> I, I would rather you yeah. get it wrong and explain to it to me right now and understand it than for you <laughs> to have gotten right. And then just be like, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Like, leave me alone. It's yeah, like, that's funny. That reminds me of my like older, I, I used to be, believe it or not, students who have me now, I think sometimes think that I'm kind of combative in class. I used to be way worse. <laughs> and I remember one of the things that people would say when I'm like arguing with them, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, and I'm explaining to them, I see why the right answer is right. And I see why the wrong answer is wrong. And I, I'm happy to explain it to you 10 different ways. But then <laughs> halfway through the like, discussion yeah the student will come will come back to oh no but i got it right i got it right yeah. as as like as a way of because they got it right then that's their evidence for i understand it yeah yeah and it's like well i mean from random guessing you're gonna get one out of five right like the the broken clock is gonna be wrong or sorry the broken clock is gonna be right 20% of the time. It's not yeah. just like twice a day. The broken clock is right yeah, on an yeah. actual clock on the LSAT. The broken clock is wrong pretty frequently. Yeah. Or, and it's weird sorry. because yeah. even 20% is actually not even accurate because there are some real shit answers, right? Like just no one's oh, going to pick right. those. And so then you're down to two or three. Now you're looking yeah. at 33% chance of getting it right or 50% chance of getting it right. Like, okay, let's flip a coin. Right. <laughs> like the game really is... <clears throat> You don't understand the question if you don't understand why the most attractive wrong answer is wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't understand if you don't understand why the right answer is right. Yeah. Uh, in your review, that's what you really need to be focusing on. Students always love to ask these big picture questions, you know, um, about how many passages they should be doing. And they, they look they're looking at it on this grand scope, the, the bigger like, I, I want you to zoom in more. You just can't be making mistakes. You just you have to clean that shit up. So at at 60 to 90 percent accuracy, if you try to do four passages, you're missing more than one passage worth of questions. And so it's clearly not a good investment. But I, I agree that I think what Sneha should do in the short term is actually take it down even further to two passages. Can you get 95 or 100 percent accuracy on two passages? Because then I would start to believe you that you actually understand what you're doing. Then maybe you can expand that back to three passages. But keep the accuracy high, because if it dips back down to 80 percent, then it's like, well, OK, but <laughs> you're leaving so many points behind. Anything more for Sneha? Well, I think just for her and for students in general, when you said, I want people to zoom in, the yeah. image that came right in my head was like a scientist looking over like a microscope. The devil's in the fucking details, yeah. right? Like you have to know exactly what amino acids connected with what other amino acids or whatever the fuck they did. You can't just be like, well, there's something going on here. And therefore what? Like you have to get the nitty gritty. You have to understand yeah. the exact details, but then those exact details reveal the universe, right? Like you, oh, that's what's happening there. Now we can make some grand conclusion from the details, not the other way around. Yeah, yeah. And and lawyers really do. I mean, there's a reason why you have lawyers look at stuff. 
Yeah. Because <laughs> the MBAs who created the deal are going to miss all kinds of details. They're thinking big picture. Oh, yeah. big merger. Which Yay. is great. That's great. That's <laughs> cool. Great. You're all going to yeah. make billions of dollars and buy an island. Good for you. Yeah. But you have lawyers for a reason because yeah. you guys know that your shit is not tight. <laughs> like you have to put it to the people, the mm -hmm. crazy people yeah. who are going to be in the office at midnight dotting I's and crossing T's and just making sure that they see all of the granular details all mm -hmm. the way down to every last detail. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've got to get better at on not just reading comp, but the LSAT generally, you just have to, you just have to insist on picking right answers. Yeah. Wrap that all up. I don't think you're rationalizing a bad approach at all. Sneha. I think that you absolutely got the right advice that you should for now do three passages, but I, I'm, I'm going to say you should probably actually just be doing two passages. A and if you can do two perfect passages, then, OK, let's let's try to do a third. Yeah, even then it's like two and a half, right? You, you don't need to go from right. two to three. You're just doing the next question right. in that third passage. Yeah, I mean, because on the low end, right? Sneha's accuracy on the low end is 60 percent. Well, do the first two passages, get them all right, randomly guess on everything else in the remainder of the section. And you're already at 60 percent accuracy for the entire section. Yeah. Yep. That's without even doing half the section. And you're still at 60 percent accuracy for the section. Yeah. How did that magic happen? Yeah. <laughs> well, because <laughs> you get free points for guessing on the ones that you didn't attempt. The broken clock is right on 20% of those questions. You just pick any letter and you're gonna get a free point 20% of the time. So don't be burning up all your free points by inaccurately answering questions. Yeah. But there's that metaphor that I think of sometimes, which is like, it's like you have to drop a coin in the slot to do a question. You have to pay for it. Mm. And it, it costs you, um, one-fifth of a point mm. right because mm. if you don't do the question at all you get a fifth of a point for free on average mm. yeah yeah right you time, randomly guess yeah you have to yeah and now you you have to invest two things you have to invest time and you have to invest your one-fifth of a point that you're going to get for free if you just randomly guess on it yeah and you're the wager that you're making is I'm going to invest this time and I'm going to invest this free one fifth of a point that I would mm -hmm. be getting if I just randomly guessed on this question. And yeah. now I'm going to actually do the question. Yeah. And when I do the question, I now no longer have any chance of getting it randomly right. I'm going to turn it into a one or a zero. And if you turn it into a zero, that's a disaster because you've spent one fifth of a point and you've spent some time only to miss a question. And what I want you to do instead is I want you to be like judiciously investing those one fifth of a point and that time that you're investing. And I just want you to be committed to the idea that you're not doing a question unless you get it right. Yeah. Because you got to be turning those one fifths into ones, <laughs> not turning the one fifths into zeros, which is what people do when they try to finish the section. Yep. Anyway, it sounds like the tip that she had gotten was a pearl. Yeah. Do three passages instead of four. Yeah. Even more of a pearl if someone had said, you know, consider doing two passages. Yeah. Or even one. Start with one. <laughs> Start with one question. I mean, yeah. like read the passage, get the first question right. Yep. Okay. If you can do that, then the second question. Mm -hmm. Scoreboard now. There's lots of bad advice out there. This was actually a pearl. The scoreboard now is 27 pearls against 76 turds and 26 ties. So be careful where you're getting your LSAT advice. If you have a pearl versus turd candidate, you can let us know at thinkinglsat.com or find us on social at thinkinglsat. We've got an email here from Anonymous. It says, conservatives at law school. Hi, Ben and Nathan. I was wondering your thoughts on applying to law school as a conservative. I'm socially conservative, but I don't fit neatly into any political school of thought. I'm fine with being the odd one out, and I enjoy surround, being surrounded by people who disagree with me, but I also don't want to be in a situation where being honest about my point of view will hurt me in terms of relationships with professors or opportunities for experience. When I look at faculty pages and what types of things homepages of certain schools advertise, 
I'm concerned it won't be a good place for me to engage my interests. At the same time, I would like to apply to some of these liberal leaning schools, especially the top schools. Do you think this is a reasonable concern to have when looking at where to apply? Am I overestimating the amount that political POVs will even come into play? I think the I think anonymous you might be overestimating the amount. I mean, law schools tend to be left leaning, um, but that doesn't really matter. And in fact, look at it as a great opportunity to hear different perspectives, which it sounds like you're open to, and modifying your views. I'm not saying that you should become left leaning. I'm just saying that when you put your ideas through a furnace, they're going to become better. Um, I, I can only see good things here. And, you know, if you're ever concerned about sharing your ideas in a way that would offend people, just take the time to listen. Like it's law school. You're going there, you're learning, you're getting a grade in classes. If you feel like something's too controversial, just listen. Yeah. Depending on how extreme your views are, you know, I mean, there are some schools that I can see, you know, you're going to have a hard time if you write your personal statement about how um, you are, you think that you're worried about the gay agenda or something. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, there, there's some schools where if, if you say shit like that, they're going to be like, OK, we don't want this bigot on our campus. Yep. You know, um, if you say stuff that's racist, homophobic, um, if you think women should not be in the workforce, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know how conservative there's conservative and then there's like real conservative. I don't know what you mean. Yeah, there's such a spectrum. I mean, the fact that you. You enjoy being surrounded by people who disagree with you. Maybe you're maybe you're in the more reasonable realm. I have no clue. Yeah. But um, because there are also like people who just, you know, they're far out there. It's like, what? There's a whole world of people that just live in these silos. And, they, and there's they, people that are way far out there on the left. too. Yeah, absolutely. They're all over. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're going to encounter all the weirdos in law school. There, there will. Don't worry. There will be Republicans and Democrats. I mean, look, probably it's like, what do you think it is, Ben, for graduation rates for like law law school graduates, how do you think it breaks down Republican versus Democrat? Law school tends to lean female, which leans Democrat. Yeah. So maybe 60, my, 40. I don't know. Yeah. I, I would think it's like 60, 40. And I also want So it's not like it's extreme, right? It's certainly yeah. not like this yeah. monolith. The, I think that there is a lot of like right wing media out there that tries to perpetuate this myth about, law schools being these crazy liberal bastions and it's like, you know, conservative conservatives are being drummed out of these schools and play. Yeah. Okay. That ain't happening at law school. Yeah. What What's happening at law school is they try to look super progressive on the surface because I think they think that that's what students want. Mm. But the reality is they try to turn everybody into a law firm lawyer. <laughs> And there is nothing liberal about law firms like, you know, the individual members, the, the individual worker bees who who become like grist for the mill. <laughs> they can have whatever political, whatever politics they want. But the law firm is going to, you know, you're, you're not going to you're just not going to express those opinions <laughs> because it's not your job to express those opinions. Your job is to do the work that's been assigned to you for 16 hours a day. Which is often big business. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, that's the whole thing about law school is that they get you in there on like these promises of like, well, you've really social got social justice, yeah. social justice, environmental, um, you know, <laughs> whatever a clinic and, you know, a special classes and elective paths and all this bullshit. We're ranked number 12th in the country for who knows what. Immigration reform. Yeah. Uh, whatever it is, you know, yeah. just any any cause of the day. And yeah. and I don't like I, I'm not trying to be totally cynical about it. Like, I OK, I believe that these are well-meaning programs and that they really want to do this work and that they are working on doing that work. But the law school just doesn't run if it doesn't churn out big law lawyers. <laughs> like yeah. That's 
the only reason why the the salaries are so high, like the average salary, right, the mean salary of one hundred thousand dollars, that doesn't that's that doesn't happen because of all the social justice warriors. That happens because of the people who go straight in to become an associate at a firm right out of law school. And those people make two hundred thousand dollars. And at that point, the firm isn't going to care about your politics. I don't think at all. The firm's just going to be like, as long as you shut up about it, that's cool. Mm hmm. <laughs> right. Like they want you to be this like perfect machine lawyer. Yeah. You're just not you're just not going to be allowed to represent your own personal feelings one way or the other. It's irrelevant. It's unprofessional. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's like not the job. That's just not that's not the point. We, we didn't ask you about your opinion of anything. I think anonymous might want to consider applying to certain schools in certain parts of the country. I've heard that George Mason University just here in Virginia is more conservative leaning, but I don't necessarily think this person wants to go places where he or she is just going to hear the same ideas. Yeah, but I think there's places where this person isn't going to feel comfortable. Like strike Berkeley off your list. I don't think you want to go to UC Berkeley. I don't think you want to live in Berkeley. I know you say you like being surrounded by people who disagree with you. I don't think you like it that much. <laughs> I, don't, I just don't think you're going to want to be in a community of people who have the opinions that they have in Berkeley. Not that Berkeley doesn't create big law lawyers as well. But, you know, do you want to be at a campus that's like well known for progressive activism? Probably not. I would consider, you know, there are schools that have like religious missions on their website. So a school like Pepperdine in, in L.A., in Malibu, hmm. I mean, that school is going to like talk to you about your Christian something or other as part of the application. That might yeah. be good for you if you're worried about this. Yeah. I mean, socially conservative, does that have anything to do with the religion? It certainly could. Doesn't have to, though. Just depends. Doesn't, yeah. Doesn't have to. No. No, doesn't have to. Um, I th very frequently is, though. Sure. <laughs> My advice would still be apply broadly, see what offers yeah, yeah. you get. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And just don't think so much about this. Yeah. I, I would think about what you're writing about in your personal statement, though. Because. Mm -hmm. There's there are things that you could say in your personal statement where I think that, uh, you know, if you were on the bubble at all in certain schools, they're going to see these things on your personal statement. They're going to be like, yeah, probably not a good fit for our community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so like if you have been strongly on the cause of, you know, some, something religious or, you know, if if you've got I'm, I'm a little worried when anonymous says. I'm concerned it won't be a good place for me to engage my interests. Hmm. Like what interests are those? Yeah. What do you think law school is? Cause I'll yeah. tell you what it's not. <laughs> it's just not engagement. <laughs> well, it's just not about you. Yeah. They don't give a shit about you. It's not about you. It's about, are you going to be able to become a gladiator of the English language to fight these legal battles and it, it should be irrelevant what team you're fighting for. They're going to, you know, they, they say that they're going to teach you how to think like a lawyer and that you're going to be able to argue any position. Yeah. I mean, if you can't argue any position, then you're not a good lawyer. So you, you're going to, you're going to have to become kind of agnostic as you think your way through these issues in law school. Anyway, you're going to have to be like, well, I, we're making legal arguments. It's not really about morals. It's about, which is interesting, right? Because that is an ethos itself, but. <laughs> right. <laughs> but whatever. I mean, like that's that's the ethos is like stop worrying about different sides. Get good at making an argument for one side and at the same time making the opposing argument. Right away, like, can you do both? Yeah, that's the skill that they want you to get good at. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Next one up is uh, from Jackson. The subject is testing with accommodations. Jackson writes, good afternoon, LSAT demon. I have been granted time and a half on the January 2024 LSAT. With the time extension, I regularly test at 175 and above. 
Okay. I'm glad we have made the, I'm glad we've made it more fair by giving you this accommodation. <laughs> However, I have recently encountered an un- unexpected mental challenge. Now that I know the potential to reach a high score, I've assumed that I have the ability to test perfect or nearly perfect. Consequently, when I complete a question and I am not entirely self-assured that I selected the correct answer choice, I will dwell on the question and lose confidence in my ability. As a result, I will make silly mistakes or be incorrect on the questions that follow. Do you have any suggestions for altering my approach? Or do you think this is a self-inflicted barrier? Sincerely, Jackson. Uh, wow. The time and a half is, it's just, I don't know where they came up with the arbitrary default to time and a half. But what they're not, they're just not understanding how much a few minutes on the margins makes a big difference on this test. And they're just not, they just don't realize that 18 additional minutes per section is time. It's not, it's not just like it's enough time to make it fair. It's, it's too much time to where you end up doing this kind of like triple thinking that Jackson is doing. Yeah, it's wild. Well, because this is time and a half and that's not even their nuclear option. Their nuclear option is double time plus breaks plus <laughs> unlimited stop the clock breaks. Yeah, stop the clock. That's then, a crazy one. Yeah. And then when you start it again, you get an extra minute. Like what the hell? <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know what's going on there, but time and a half should be their nuclear option. That should be the longest accommodation available and they should have a bunch of increments in between, like five minutes extra, 10 minutes extra. It's wild. I, yeah, anyway. it's insane. <laughs> Can we help Jackson? Um, It's just so patently unfair. It's just obviously unfair. The accommodations. I'm sorry. I, people hate me for this, but it's just not. I wish there was a way that we could make it fair, but yeah. there is no fair because For every person who, you know, they're really legitimately struggling and they need this extra time because of dyslexia or some whatever processing or whatever it is, you know, they need the extra time to be able to get to 165 or whatever. That to me makes sense. But when we see so many people in the 99th percentile or 99.9th percentile, right, 175 and above, like that's the 99th percentile was always 173. Now it's like 174, maybe. Yeah, but still it's like, okay, so you got extra time so that you could score better than 99 out of 100 other test takers. Yeah, you're in the (laughs) 1%. You're already there, Jackson. Like maybe stop thinking about perfect. That's the problem. You're already perfect. You're in the 99th percent. Yeah. Yeah. And there's going to be variance around that 175. So just make sure that you take the official test multiple times. If you yep. regularly test at 175 or above, then that means, you know, it's not going to take too many attempts and you should get one of those 175 or ho- hopefully even above. And at that point, the variance is your friend, right? You'd rather yeah. score 175 plus or minus five than score 175 plus or minus zero. Yeah. Because 175 plus or minus zero, your best score is going to be a 175. But if you score 175 plus or minus five, then your best score is going to be a 180. Mm -hmm. If you just keep taking it. So, yeah, yeah, I would just calm down, I guess. And at your level, you don't you don't need to get every 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 one right. There are going to be ones where you get, you know, probably what happens at that level is you recognize it as a hard question. You recognize that there's something going on there. There's something that you're not quite seeing, but you still know that it's not this answer and it's not that answer and it's Mm -hmm. not that answer. And you get it down to two probably and you go, well, it's got to be one of these. And then at at some point you do have to just kind of go with your gut and say, "Okay, well, my spidey senses are tingling on this one and not that one. And so I think it's probably this one. And you're not going to be 100 percent accurate on those. You know, you're you're going to but you you will probably be like 75, 80 percent accurate on those. And since that's only going to happen to you once or twice per section. You just got to roll with it. Just be okay with, yeah, okay. I didn't get to a hundred percent on that one, but I am getting to a hundred percent on 23 or 24 out of 25 questions in the section. And yeah, that's going to be plenty. Nathan, you and I get questions wrong every now and then. Oh, of course. Like, yeah. Maybe no, you're totally. just saying too, too high of a bar for yourself, Jackson. I think yeah. that's great advice to just look at the ones that you've crossed out and make sure. Yeah. Hey, those seem like they're wrong. So then pick an answer and move on. 
Maybe also just practice. This may sound a little soft, but like gratitude. Just say, hey, look, I'm grateful yeah. that I got time and a half. And I'm grateful that I'm scoring in a range that most people will never get to. So yeah. it's already good enough. <laughs> yeah. Yes. A little gratitude goes a long way. Think about what your grandparents were doing when they were your age. They were probably like supporting children by working their asses off. And, uh, you know, you're studying for this test. So you're you're in good shape, Jackson. Thanks for writing in. Yeah. Next one's from Finn. Um, the subject is letter of recommendations. Hi, Ben and Nathan. I work in the legal org of a five, uh, sorry, of a fortune 30 company doing work in the kind of law I want to practice. Cool. Wow. I work closely with a colleague who went to law school slash bar certified, but is not a practicing attorney. And then in parentheses, JD advantage job. <laughs> That's some shit that law schools try to tell you. <laughs> yeah. Law schools, they love to point. Oh, yeah. Well, no. Our graduates, no, they don't. Yeah, those jobs, they they don't need a JD for those, but JD advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Which you can't prove that it's not an advantage, right? Like when you get that job at Starbucks with your JD, JD advantage. You stuck out. You had a JD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, anyway, <clears throat> Finn continues. They also know that is... My employer? Yeah, they, my employer, know that I am considering law school in the next five years. Would it be bad if I plan to ask them? Oh, you mean your colleague. Sorry. I work closely with a colleague who went to law school and now has this JD Advantage job. So they're not a lawyer, even though they did go to law school. They work with you. <laughs> you don't have a JD, they, but you work side by side with this person. Tells you a lot about the JD that this person has. What do you mean? I think. Well, <laughs> this person isn't a lawyer. This person is practicing. This person has, it sounds like, Finn's job, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. So what good did that JD actually do for that person if you are working closely with this person and you don't have a JD? Mm. I mean, yeah. I guess maybe they're not at the same level. But, but could you get into that position without? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it just seems like, you know, if that's your goal, like that's probably not your goal, right? Your goal is probably higher than that, I hope. Otherwise, why are you considering law school? You're already working in the legal org of a Fortune 30 company doing work in the kind of law you want to do. So you're you're trying to do something different by getting a JD, right? Anyway, the question is, would it be bad if I ask them, that is my colleague, instead of counsel at the company? They, my colleague, would be able to speak to my work better than counsel would. Yeah, Thoughts? Then ask, yeah Finn. ask the colleague. Sorry, <laughs> didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. No, you're right. Yeah, ask the colleague because law schools want a letter from someone who knows you and knows work, your work, and can talk specifically about that work and why you're good or not good, ideally good. Um, I think... Finn here is worried about the the position of the person writing the letter or the the fact that they're an actual attorney. None of that matters. No. And, you know, another example would be if you're having a question, should I have my direct supervisor write me a letter or should I go have the head of the legal department who doesn't know me write the letter? Hmm. Obviously, you need the person who actually knows what you did. Yeah. <laughs> so the person who can speak confidently and with actual knowledge of your work mm -hmm. is always going to be a better letter than uh, somebody with a fancy title. Last one is coming to us from Susan. It says another question on whether or not to study logic games. Okay, Eric, producer Eric notes that Susan scored 156 on her diagnostic. After a couple of weeks of study, she scored a 160 with minus 14 in logic games. <laughs> wow, that's hard to do. 160 with minus 14 in games. That means you're really, really solid on LR and RC both. Yeah. 
yeah. missing that many questions on games. I mean, you got nine points on games, but you still yeah, scored almost 160. all your. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wow. Because yeah. almost all your points are being lost in games. Not necessarily all. Um, but damn yeah. close. Okay. Okay. Susan writes, I am definitely improving in my, in my understanding of logic games and, uh, and having a lot of fun working on my skills there. Oh, I like to hear that. But I'm wondering if you think it's worth putting in the hours to master them when I am not in a rush to test and I know it will be a long road to get to mastery as opposed to spending all that time on LR and RC. Do you think we'll see score inflation in August due to the <laughs> end of logic games and that it would be worth getting a high score before then? No. My GPA is a 3.86. Goal is to not pay for law school. Cool. You know... I think Susan thinks that this process is going to take longer than it might, especially for someone mm. who's doing so well in the other two sections and for someone who's having fun doing games. I wouldn't stop yeah. improving LR and reading comp, obviously, because that's where your bread and butter is going to be after <laughs> June of 2024. But I could see this person taking the test in... April and June, if they bring up the games faster than she expects. Yeah, I would say it doesn't matter, really, Susan, if you're really not in a rush to test. And if you just want to say, ah, fuck it, I'll wait till August. I don't I'm not mad about that at all. That's that's totally fine. If you, that's a valid decision that you could make, you could just say, hey, I'm naturally good at LR and RC. I'll just play that game instead mm -hmm. and just put the logic games aside. I, I'm totally cool with that, but I would also be cool with keep having fun prepping the games. And if you can see it as an opportunity, then that's what I really that's that's what I would really be excited about it. If you because the, the thing is, like, as good as you are at LR and RC, you're still more likely to score perfect on the games if you get good at the games. And, you know, you, you can be the best there is on LR and RC and still miss a question sometimes. But you don't even have to be close to the best there is to get perfect on the games. <laughs> like the games is, you know, people that are just not even good at the rest of the test, but they still score perfect on the games because the games are so solvable, like obviously solvable. Yeah. I don't know much about the GRE but or the GMAT, but it makes me think about those those perfect scores in the math section. Like right. There's so many more perfect scores in the math section than there is in the verbal section. Right. Right. Good and reason. so, yeah. So I, if you're enjoying it and you, and you see the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, like if you see how, well, if I can just get one perfect game, then I could, you know, maybe get two perfect games. And if I can get two perfect games, then maybe I can get three. And if I can get three, then why can't I get four? And if you start to look at it that way and realize like, hey, in a month or two, I might be scoring perfectly on these sections. Mm -hmm. Then I do still think that, uh, yeah, the June, maybe even April, you know, two months to, to prep for the April test um, before you even have to sign up for it. So, yeah, I would say keep studying the games until February 29th. Decide whether you want to register for that April test or not. And then take the test in April and or June with games. Then there's always the backup of taking it without the games in August and beyond. I, good problem to have, I think, for Susan. It, it's great that you're so strong on those other sections. You could really knock it out of the park if you were able to add perfect games to that. And if not, it sounds like you're a real good candidate for something in the 170s anyway, just because of how strong you're going to be in LR and RC. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Uh, last item on our agenda is words of the week. <laughs> LSAT demon student Vicky suggested a word via the ask button. She wanted to talk about the word eschew. Yeah. You familiar eschew. with this word? Eschew? Yeah, I am. Yeah. I've always said eschew. I don't know if that's right, but the idea. Eschew. Yeah. Okay. The idea I get with this word is it's it's almost like something is repugnant to you and so you're you're avoiding it but there's this it's almost like strong avoidance it's like pushing away i don't know how close that is to the actual definition but it's stronger than to avoid 
It says to avoid habitually, especially on moral or practical grounds. Uh, and then it's offering shun as a as a synonym. Hmm. At least the definition that I'm looking at. Okay. And um, yeah, but it, I, don't, I think it doesn't have to be. It says especially on moral or practical grounds. Right. So. Hmm staunch religious people might eschew alcohol eschew eschew it looks like eschew is also an acceptable pronunciation oh okay eschew yeah eschew or eschew um but yeah it just basically means avoid and i think it would be correct to say that you know my uh nephew ryan eschewed eschews the um broccoli on his plate yes right it's That's not, not just a like, moral or a practical yeah. ground, but it is a habitual avoidance. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Vicky. Yeah, the next one's from you. Yeah. Um, the word tautology came up in a class of mine. Do you know that word? I don't know it well enough. I know it it's means like repetitive or something like that, but... Um, I feel like it it has more meanings than I'm aware of. Yeah. So 1A and 1B here on Merriam-Webster, tautology is needless repetition of an idea, statement, or word. Mm, So so it's needless. um, It's not just repetitive. No, it's rhetorical repetition. So if you say always and forever. Sure. Okay. An instance of this repetition. Yeah. So a phrase, the phrase, uh, a beginner who has just started. Is a tautology, yep. Yep. right? Okay. <laughs> ben like kind of cringed at that. It's yeah. If it's a if it's a phrase that you look at that and you go, you know, I really don't think we need that. Yep. The second definition comes from logic. Hmm. It says a statement that is true by virtue of its logical form alone. A logical combination of sentences that is always true, regardless of the truth or falsity of the constituent sentences is known as a tautology. Huh. Oh. Who survives? The fittest. Who are the fittest? Those that survive. Mm. That's Almost a quote. Circular. It is, yes. And so I, it, it, when I see that on the LSAT, and it, this appeared on an actual LSAT question, and I think that they were, I, I do think that they were getting at that second, um, that second definition from, from logic, where it's like, it's just, from the form of your statement, from the logical form of your statement, mm. it's a, it like it proves itself. Mm. Like, I think if you make a really tight argument and you state your conclusion, I think that is in a way a tautology because you didn't need to state your conclusion. Mm. Right. If your facts actually justify your conclusion, mm. then you could have left your conclusion out of it because the facts prove that conclusion anyway. So yeah. I think it would be correct to say that it's a tautology at that point. Okay. And I think that's what they're getting at here when they say a logical combination of sentences that is always true, regardless of the truth or falsity of the constituent sentences, because that's what we're doing on the LSAT, right? You're not actually considering the truth or falsity of the premises. You're just like, well, whether these are true or false, we're going to accept them as true. Now, Hmm. does that justify the conclusion? Hmm. Yeah. So if I go back to this original definition, it says a, a tautology is a statement that is true by virtue of its logical form alone. Mm -hmm. That does sound very close to what we would call a valid argument on the LSAT, Mm -hmm. where the premises, regardless of the truth of the underlying claims, if we just accept them as true, then the conclusion is something that has to be true. It must follow from them. Yep. Yep. Interesting. That's right. Okay. Now, producer Eric adds, uh, tautology is similar to one of my favorite words, pleonasm. Wow, I had never heard pleonasm before. Okay. Um, Eric says legalese is full of these examples include null and void terms and conditions each and every <laughs> according to Wikipedia, such legal doublets often originate in the transition from use use of one language for legal purposes to another in Britain from a native English term to a Latin or law French term in romance speaking countries from Latin to the vernacular. To ensure understanding, the terms from both languages were used. Oh, interesting. 
Okay. You know, you know why they persist? I can tell you this. Because boilerplate? Boilerplate and attorneys are scared shitless, right? Oh, like yeah. If you cut one of those words out and all of a sudden <laughs> yeah. there's some right. like... You thought you were editing it to make it sound better. So instead of terms and conditions, you just made it terms. And instead of each and every, you just made it each. Yeah. And then it's like, wait a second. I ha- there's a there's a document over here that says terms. And there's another document over here that says conditions. You motherfucker. You fucker. Yeah. <laughs> You fucked us. <laughs> and you know, opposing counsel is going to be jumping all over that. And the judge too, they're like, well, geez, all the, all the case law up to this point said terms and conditions. What am oh, I to man. do? Yeah, exactly. That's why all that bloated boilerplate just gets more and more and more bloated yeah. because no it's one like wants nobody to wants to ever take anything out. We always want to just put it all in there just in case. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So that was a uh, tautology. Interesting. And then yours, you, you came up with one as well. You want to talk yeah. about it? I have two words in here that I had to look up. Um, a lot of my words, you can figure them out from context, but I still, I just like to look them up to really clarify in my mind exactly what was being said. Is this from um, stories about the Harvard president who uh, plagiarized on her work? It is. I, I took yeah, her name okay. out of this to, yeah. to, to avoid oh, whatever I'm putting it back in. Doing. I don't care. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah, has been okay. in the New York Times. I mean, it's not like... <laughs> so, yeah, the Harvard president is under investigation for uh, apparently cheating on her dissertation. Yes. Uh, and she, it sounds like, is very likely to get shit canned. But anyway. Yeah. So this sentence is, yes, about her. And it says, she would be denigrating the values of Veritas that she and the university aspire to uphold. So that was the first one I looked up, Veritas. That's actual Latin, right? Yeah, that's Latin. It's the Latin god of truth. So it's another okay. word for truth. And of course, we have words truth. like veros- veracity, right? That sounds similar. Or Sure. Verify sounds similar. I don't know if they're related or not, but <laughs> why is Veritas have to be there? Why doesn't why can't truth just be there? Yeah, why can't it be Harvard, in English? Right? It, yeah, yeah, I guess. Okay, and if it was a <laughs> what is it? A pleonasm? Pleonasm? Yeah. Um, oh, truth and Veritas. Yeah, yeah, truth and Veritas. <laughs> is it Veritas or Veritas? I don't, I don't know. Anyways, who knows? Don't this, say that word. No one should say that word. No. But yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Then the sentence. Good continues. to know what it means. Yeah. Yeah. The sentence continues. Even her acknowledgement section in her dissertation has phraseology transparently cribbed from those of others. I hadn't heard the word cribbed really used in this way. Yeah. It just means stolen. Huh? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And you might remember like they used to talk about if you read old timey novels, Mm. you'll read people talking about having a crib sheet. Oh, okay. Yeah. What's a crib sheet? It's like a cheat sheet for your cheat sheet or crib notes. Sometimes professors like you might have had a teacher where they're like, well, you can bring a crib sheet. You can bring a, Uh, you know, you can bring a one, a one page, whatever, or something like that. But anyway, what does cribbed cribbed here means stolen, right? Stolen. Yeah. So these, these phrases, this phraseology was transparently or openly stolen from others. Even her acknowledgments section in her dissertation has phraseology transparently cribbed from those of others. Not good. Ouch. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Seems like she's in a bit of a pickle. Um, Okay. Anything else there? No. Love it when we get suggestions for uh, word of the week. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say. Say it. Oh, please. If you come across a word, and I hope that you are coming across multiple words throughout the week that you decide to look up. I mean, we're doing this, what, every day, right? One or two words a day? Oh, yeah. Uh, No, I mean, way more than that. I've been on a reading streak lately, Mm. and I'm on vacation, so I've got my Kindle with me, and I'm reading every day. And it's like, uh, there is no reading without looking up words, ever. I mean, I, I rely on that Kindle Oh, you know, it's so nice because it's click it's on the just word right and get a there. definition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm on that constantly. Constantly. Yeah. Yeah. So please look up words and, and, you know, expand your vocabulary and then share them with us. Share them with all the listeners here. We want to know what words you're coming across and uh, we'll share them here. 
just go yeah, to thinking LSAT.com or find us on social at thinking LSAT. If you have questions about LSAT demon, you can email the world's best customer service team. That's help at LSAT demon.com. Please email them. You will be delighted with their response. Check out our other podcast, LSAT Demon Daily. Subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. It really does help us a lot, y'all, if you just hit the subscribe button. I don't know why, but the algorithmic uh, Mm. overlords really care how many (laughs) subscribers you have to your show. So if you want to do us a favor and subscribe on YouTube, subscribe in your uh, Apple Podcasts app, Spotify, wherever, please follow us if you can, and we will love you forever. That was episode 435 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school.